Um, it is Friday, is the 20th of January. It is a momentous day in New Zealand political history. After the shock announcement yesterday of the Prime Minister, uh, just, um, just after one o'clock, actually at one to one, Shane knew. Um, he was informed by a Labour caucus member that the Prime Minister was about to resign. But can I also give Shane Norton, my producer, some credit? Because credit where credit is due. He picked last year, about October, that the Prime Minister would not make it through to Election Day. And I said, bollocks. I think I said bollocks with a capital B-O. And then L-L-O-C-K-S. Dogs bollocks, I said. I think I could have even been more descriptive. Fortunately, unlike a certain other wager with another platform uh, producer, I didn't put any money on it. <laughs> so all I have to do is a public kowtow and acknowledgement that some bloody producer from Cromwell in central Otago has a much better political antennae than I. There you go. The humiliation. <laughs> and just to make things worse, his favourite soccer team, Arsenal, with the accent on us, are now leading the British um, Premier League football championship in Britain and look like they might just win it. So when we talk about dogs bollocks, he is at the moment, I have to say, just like one. <laughs> ah, every dog goes and finds one um, and licks it to their heart's content. My analogy is concluded. I won't move on. All right. Um, and that's probably what we thought yesterday. I thought instantly at 1 o'clock or 12.59 yesterday when Shane informed me that this is the end of the Labour Greens coalition government. Uh, in fact, obviously, I'm not the only person. There's a cartoon from Emerson this morning in the New Zealand Herald. Very good cartoonist, by the way. I've always liked Emerson. Um, he can actually cartoon. I always think it's quite useful to actually be able to draw. But like Tremaine, uh, formerly of the Otago Daily Times, at least you've got an artist, not like some of this nonsense that's going on. And he's got a wry sense of humour, unlike all these PC woke um, cartoonists today. But there is Jacinda Ardern flying off into the air with parachute uh, from a plane. And uh, the voice of the captain says, it's okay, I used to run an airline. I think I can take it from here. Uh, meaning that um, he sees it pretty much the way I do. This is a lay down Mazir by the Labour Party. No, not by the Labour Party. By one particular selfish person. I have read some bollocks in the past 24 hours or 21 hours as to do with how Jacinda Ardern was A, the best Prime Minister New Zealand's ever had, B, uh, the most caring and compassionate leader we'll ever have, C, hounded out of office by misogynistic and toxic people, probably including you, um, D, that New Zealand will never be the same as a consequence of her love embrace of the last five years. And I've even read, in fact, it's been headlined now by stuff, the well-known lefty mainstream media organ in this country that used to be a reputable news organisation before they decided that polemics was more important than politics and the truth, that they are suggesting this morning that the next Prime Minister of New Zealand must be Māori. Mm. 
So that's in that kind of environment, we are starting to understand that Jacinda Ardern was not just a leader for the left in this country. She was their untouchable, unimpeachable saint. She was the queen of woke. And she should never have faced the toxic criticism that she has faced as a result of being a woman. I remember, because I'm old enough to remember, as I said in my comments to Sean, Bill Rowling and Rob Muldoon, who were vilified and personally attacked, Rob Muldoon in particular, by the left and the same liberal lovies, probably the parents of the current ones, and the most appalling, toxic and personal terms ever. I remember it being fair game for all these liberal le leading liberal lovies and the left to consider the family of all those people to be fair game as well and to be attacked too. Um, I've been in leadership responsibilities as a mayor and I was a centre-right mayor who was loathed and detested, despised by these same liberal left lovies and they were quite happy to attack me personally, professionally and members of my family to make their political point. So at the same time that when, so I just on a personal small local government level to a major macro prime minister level, it has been commonplace for liberals in the left to cauterise, criticise, personally attack the persons, the personalities, the families, the friends of anybody that they didn't agree with. And finally, when somebody went the other way, so there were people on the other side employing the same tactics, none of which I particularly admire or respect, but it happens. This is apparently an example of toxic masculinity, um, a culture in New Zealand where we are somehow all responsible and to blame for the Prime Minister having to tearfully step down from the Premier position of this country yesterday afternoon. Um, I have never personally attacked Jacinda Ardern for anything since she's been Prime Minister. I might have said that I believe her policy decisions are wrong, but I've never just looked at her and described her physically or in terms of because she's a woman and I'm a man or because she has some sort of personality or character def defect. I have never, ever done that since Jacinda Ardern was Prime Minister. In fact, I remember writing an article saying that if the Labour Party wanted to win the 2017 election, they needed to make Jacinda Ardern their leader as soon as possible. And I'll even go one step further. I voted Labour in 2017. All right, I voted Labour and therefore with Jacinda Ardern as their leader in 2017. I didn't in 2020, but I did in 2017. All right, just so you know. Um, but I can say right now that my disappointment with her personally is that when things got tough, she decided yesterday to cut and run. Now, the official explanation, and let's just take Jacinda at her word for a moment, is that Jacinda has resigned because, and she said it twice yesterday, I've got nothing left in the tank, which, as others have noted, was an odd analogy to use when you're trying to go carbon-free by 2030. But doesn't matter. The battery's run out, she might have said. I've got nothing there. And she also made the analogy in the question time when journalists were asking her after her announcement that 
should a suggestion should, should go should be in a wartime prime minister um like peter fraser and i guess massey way back in the first world war before her which was bollocks again it's a rewriting of history covid was not a world war it was a mass overreaction to what happened to be a quite virulent virus that killed vulnerable people and the elderly in droves yes but because we made a whole series of bad political decisions in this country we were a long way from protecting our populace in comparison to the rest of the western world despite having many many months of advance notice you remember remember when we didn't order the vaccinations because we hadn't done our job properly no not us the government so we shut down new zealand we became the hermit kingdom and there were only two other countries north korea and china that you could probably have given the analogy to in terms of that and then we did it again now the reason that people might have got a bit toxic over the last what, 18 months with the Prime Minister personally, was because she decided to make herself not just the single source of truth, but she also decided that there were a group of people amongst us, the unvaccinated, the people who chose not to get vaccinated, who we should essentially turn into second-class citizens overnight for a choice that they had made. Now, it wasn't a choice I made. I'm in the 90% that got vaccinated because I thought this is quite a good idea. My family got vaccinated because I thought that was quite a good idea. No, we're not dead. Um, but for the 10% odd who decided not to, they lost their jobs, they lost their livelihoods, they ended up almost as the victims of a civil war. And when some of them a small minority of them went mad on the grounds of Parliament in February of last year. Um, what do we know? That Jacinda Ardern, in very personal terms, prior and at the time, described them as basically the scum of the earth. And so did her ministers, without correction. Now, just think about this for a moment. Wouldn't people, certainly those people, get very upset? Wouldn't the people who got lied to, oh, like just about every local government leader in New Zealand about the future of three waters that you can opt out? No, you effing can't, because we've lied to you. Wouldn't they get a bit upset if they were lied to? Um, wouldn't the farming community, who have been somehow vilified as polluter centrals, just be a bit miffed that despite, in actual fact, the economy built on their backs to this day, they had been condemned as some form of antediluvian uh, individuals who were endangering the health of the planet on a daily basis for precocious and personal reward. Mm. So, if those were the messages of yourself and your government and your government ministers... Wouldn't you expect there to be some form of reaction? Is that the toxicity of which the liberal lobbies complain this morning? Is that when they say, oh, poor Jacinda, she had to put up with this. She didn't do anything to deserve it. Are you joking? I've lost my job. I've been vilified by the environmental community in the Teals. I've been told that I'm a subhuman. I'm told that I'm not allowed to question you because you're the single source of truth don't you think at that stage that people might just be a mit miffed and mine they might decide to push back and they're entitled to push back aren't they because we live in a democracy still live in one last time I saw so when I don't buy the argument of the liberal lovey left this morning or yesterday afternoon that this is some form of mass gangbang 
that was perpetrated upon a poor innocent woman and her family and we are somehow all to blame for her tearful resignation yesterday afternoon. I don't buy that. In addition to which, can I say, Jacinda, you took on the job. You said, I want that job. I've done it for five years. I've made a whole series of decisions. Why couldn't you have lasted until the election? Um, why couldn't you have got support around you? Why couldn't you have ensured that there was a succession plan? Why couldn't you have ensured that your constituents, who you're deserting in April, you've chosen April deliberately in Mount Albert because then there won't be a by-election, so there can't be anybody to look after them, that your 50,000 constituents in Mount Albert will be abandoned because it suits you. Why couldn't you hold on until November as at least your local MP? But no, this isn't about New Zealand. This isn't about the Labour Party and its chances. And all the people who've just... Uh, listen, if I was a Labour list MP at the moment, boy, I would have... <laughs> I'd be searching in the sit columns vacant or going on Facebook this morning or any form of job website because I won't be having a job post-October the 14th. It isn't about them, isn't it? No, this is a deeply, intensely personal and selfish decision. And, and you know, people will say particularly the liberal lovies and a certain group of sort of feminist women. How can you possibly say that? And I can say, because when you go into politics, you know what it's about. You've got your eyes open. And if you decide, it's got a bit tough. I'll tell you why the Prime Minister resigned. Because she looked ahead. Jacinda Ardern is not a stupid woman. She looked ahead. She saw what was coming. Um, food prices yesterday says forgotten. Just had their record increase over the last 12 months. The cost of living is impacting upon hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders. Um, we're looking at interest rates go up and house prices come down. New Zealanders are getting poorer every day. We're looking at crime, particularly antisocial crime, out of control, and people dying because we do not have adequate justice, nor policing policies of this country, nor the resources to combat the antisocial few. We're looking at gangs proliferate and dominate and infest and infect entire communities we are looking at a future that is really grim and tough this year uh, we're looking at three waters and we're looking at the, the detail because only the broad picture stuff has gone through parliament now it's the detail stuff we're looking at massive water bill increases for ordinary New Zealanders at a time that they're actually going to be still fighting a cost of living crisis and their job is insecure. In, feel, in fact, they feel insecure. We're looking at declining educational and schooling standards to a significant degree, so bad that over the last three years we have to give credits to kids at secondary school level because we know they haven't learnt the curriculum. So we're sending them out into the world without the same education that their peer groups of 5, 10 or 15 years would have received and we said, off you go. It is a really tough world. This is war, if you want to talk about it. Not COVID and getting it wrong. Not even the massacre of some demented individual, Brenton Tarrant in Christchurch. That's not war, that's tragedy. And countless Prime Ministers have had to deal with tragedy. I'm sorry, White Island, D Cave Creek, Pike River, just two in recent memory. There have been mass killings of innocent individuals. But does Prime Ministers resign because they had to deal with that? It built up on the pressure? It's not even their fault.
if it, as unlike Cave Creek and unlike maybe Pike River. 